Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Main Coast Chapel. We're so pleased to have each one of you with us today. Just have a few short announcements. Do we have any first time visitors with us today? Any first time visitors? As you depart this morning, there is a sheet in the entrance way for you to sign your name and email address, just your email address, if you would like to get the information from the chaplain that they send out weekly. So just put your name and email address. Uh, also on the way out, there is the angel tree for this year. Uh, the two sets of information you need to know. If you would like to assist someone on the post, on the installation, take one of the tags from the tree, and it has the information on there, who the person is, what they need, and then just sign the little sheet there, that the number that you took. They have numbers on them, 51, 52, just put your name by the number. There's also list of beads. These are from the Salvation Army. So if you take one of those, make sure that you follow the instructions on it. So again, the tree is for the installation and the long steps is for the Salvation Army. Now if you have your calendars, just a few calendar dates. Today is the last day to order poinsettias if you would like to recognize or purchase a poinsettia in honor of someone. On the 28th of November, which is a Saturday, at 10 a.m., we will start decorating for the holidays. 
So if any of you are able to assist in that, would you please do that? Matter of fact, if anyone could raise a hand to kind of give us a indication of who might be able to be here so we'll know how many people we might be able to count. Great, you we are nearing a number of 10, so bless the Lord. And then on the 29th, which is a Sunday, we will be having Hanging of the Green, Hanging of the Green here at the chapel. That will be the service. We will also be having a Christmas Eve service at this chapel. You'll get further information and instructions on that. Again, may the Lord add a blessing to each one that heard the announcement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lilly. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. This morning, our call to worship is from Psalm 145. The psalmist writes, I will exalt you, my God and King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of our praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Great is the Lord and worthy of our praise. Let us pray. Gracious God, your people have gathered this morning to worship you. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would descend upon us. That would open our hearts and our minds to the things of Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. If you would stand for our processional hymn, we have come to join in worship. several uh, prayer requests I had thought about 
And uh, I'd ask that you would keep our Linda, our son Matt, in your prayers. Um, he's pursuing a, a career change, as many of you know, and uh, he's had his application in. So if you would just keep would keep that in our prayers uh, in his future as he looks to, to make a, a career change. And uh, I got a call last night that uh, my uncle, my 98-year uncle, is not doing well. And uh, my, my prayer really is that uh, that he would be a child of God and has accepted Christ as his Savior. I'm just not quite sure. His son is a minister, and I know he has shared the gospel with his father. But, you know, as I thought about that, and I am close to my, my, my uncle, uh, that, that was really my, my heart's concern. Where is he with the Lord? Where does he stand? Where has he placed his faith? So if we would pray for, for my uncle, my namesake, my uncle Eddie, uh, as he gets ready to meet his maker. And uh, I had thought about this this past week. As we, as all indications are, we look forward to, uh, we look forward. In the, however, I want to be careful as I want to put the words here. As we say, we look forward to President, to what appears to be President-elect Biden. Um, but really what I want us to think about and what I, I probably pray about this morning is that we as the Christian church are able to support and align ourselves with those programs and policies that are godly and righteous. And we have the boldness, and we can say this for any administration, but as Christian men and women, uh, we have the boldness to gently and respectfully speak out against uh, policies and programs of any administration that do not align with the word. We had talked about from the pulpit, from here, throughout the congregation the last few weeks about supporting and uniting behind um, what appears to be the incoming president. And I just want us to think about, as mature Christian men and women, what is our obligation? And it's not an easy answer. Romans 13 teaches us to submit before the Lord, to submit before the God, those who are placed in authority over us. It talks about being honoring, it talks just about being respectful to those that are placed in authority over us. And then at the same time, we see uh, in the scriptures, we see John and uh, Peter after their arrest early on in the foundation of the Christian church. They heal a beggar in chapter 3 of Acts, chapter 4. Um, they're before the Sanhedrin, uh, before the Sadducees, the high court, the, the priestly court, the chief, uh, it says the, the chief priest, Caiaphas and Ananias are there. I mean, they're before that very big, many of the same people that Christ stood before just before that. And they say that, uh, you know, look, this is what God has called us to do. And you judge, do we follow man or do we follow God under these difficult circumstances? So they would continue, although forbidden by the high priest, to speak about the resurrection of the dead and speak about the resurrection of Christ. They in their hearts were compelled through the Holy Spirit, because it does talk about them in Scripture there, being filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, that they had a higher obligation than the chief priest, and that was to be obedient to God. So as we prepare ourselves as a nation, as a chapel community, um, to the, for the next administration, what are our responsibilities before God? Not, not an easy answer, but I want us to think about this personally, uh, whether it's in small groups, how do we pray, what's appropriate before the Lord in our prayers. So I am all about promoting and supporting all of those programs uh, in any administration that align themselves with, with the word of the Lord. Scripture talks about the boldness that we need as Christians to speak out, always respectfully, always gently, for those programs that do not align with the word of God. So uh, I would pray that this morning from, from the pulpit uh, as we move forward. And then, of course, for COVID, uh, let's make sure we keep uh, this, pray for the COVID vaccine uh, as we move forward, pray for those that are afflicted with COVID. And as we move forward to the holidays, we've already talked about it today, how our, our holidays with family and friends will be impacted this season. Um, and then we just stay healthy uh, spiritually and emotionally this holiday, Christmas season, Thanksgiving season, because we are going to be separated, many of us, from family and friends. And uh, that, that's just hard, particularly this time of year. So those are the thoughts that I have that I'd like to bring before the Lord. Uh, what are your thoughts before we go before? Monday, it was unexpected, and uh, pushes the family for all the 
Melissa's mother. Thank you. Any other thoughts you can bring before the Lord? As always, we'll make sure we pray for our military leaders as well as our political leaders that they will seek the face of God. Let's bring our thoughts before the Lord. Oh, gracious God, we thank you for this gift of prayer that you've given to us. We thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit stirs our hearts. We thank you, Lord, that we have a Savior at your right hand, who is our mediator, bringing these thoughts, these concerns, these praises before you. We pray, gracious God, that you would give us the righteous desires of our heart. We ask, Lord, for a blessing upon our nation. I pray, Lord, that as a Christian community, we are able to appropriately support those activities, those programs, those policies that align with your word, regardless of the administration. And we pray, Lord, that we can respectfully, yet boldly, and gently raise those concerns on behalf of the administration, on behalf of our local leaders, and on behalf of our nation, that we can raise concerns when our policies do not align with your word. Gracious God, we think of those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. We think, Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would show yourself to be a God of comfort and a God of compassion. For those unspoken concerns, those unspoken griefs. For those that are grieving quietly here before me this morning, Lord, I ask that you comfort them. We specifically lift up Melissa and the sheep's family as they pray for the loss of your loved ones. Gracious God, I think of my uncle, and my first prayer is that if he is not, if he does not know Christ as Lord and Savior, that through your Holy Spirit you would touch his heart, you would touch his mind, and that he would come to a saving faith. I pray those thoughts for our family and friends that are in a very similar situation, Lord. We pray for their physical healing. We pray for their spiritual healing, which comes through Christ the Lord. Gracious God, as Stephen prepares to bring the word to us this morning, we ask, Lord, for your blessing upon him. We ask, Lord, that he would boldly and accurately divide your word for us. And may we go forward closer to you with a heart of service for you in the cause of Christ. And gracious God, I lift up our leaders that you have placed over us. I lift up our military leaders this morning, and I ask, gracious God, that you would turn their hearts towards you. I ask, Lord, that you would give them a heart of service, service to this nation, and service to those service members and families that are placed in their care. And I ask, Lord, that they would seek your wisdom, they would seek your guidance, and come before you on bended knee with a heart filled with humility, humility and awe awe of the responsibility that you have placed before them, and awe that you are a God. And our scripture tells us that with God, all things are possible. And I pray, Lord, the very same for our government, our political leaders. I ask, Lord, that you would humble them as necessary, that they would come before you, that they would see your will. And we pray, Lord, that your will would be a blessing for this nation, that in the, in the weeks and months and years ahead, that we see the blessings of our Lord poured out upon this nation. And gracious God, if it is your heart's desire to judge us, we pray, Lord, that you would do it gently. Where we are called in those areas that we need to repent, personally and corporately as a country, we pray, Lord, that through the work of your Holy Spirit, that conviction that only he can bring, that we would appropriately repent for the sins of our own heart and our national sins as well. And gracious God, as we look forward to Thanksgiving, and we reflect upon your many blessings upon this nation. May we, give, may we give credit to you where credit is due. And as we look forward as a chapel community, as brothers and sisters in the faith, for this Christmas season that awaits, we pray, Lord, is that we look forward with expectation once again to the birth of Christ. That it renews in us that love of Christ, that simplicity of our, of our faith. We see that in your plan, in your loving plan of salvation, that you set a Savior into the world to be born in a manger and to die at the cross of Calvary because you loved us.
So we stand here, we come before you, Lord, heads bowed, bringing these thoughts before your throne of grace and mercy. And we pray all of these things in our Savior's name. Amen. It is time in our service for our tithes and offerings. If our ushers would come forward at this time, and what we'll do, we'll collect the tithes and offerings. If you would come forward after you collect them on the lower level here, uh, and then we'll just pray for God's blessing upon the gifts. <laughs> stand for the doxology. Gracious God, we ask simply for your blessing upon these gifts. We pray, Lord, that these gifts would go out throughout the Fort Bragg community, touching service members, touching families for the cause of Christ. And we pray, Lord, that you would impart wisdom upon our leaders as they distribute these gifts. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's get this part wrong. Our hymn of preparation. <laughs> the love of God. Please stand. <laughs>
uh, another beautiful fall morning, a little bit uh, crisp this morning, and then out here in North Carolina, it always does warm up just a little bit. Last week, and my wife and I enjoyed walking, uh, walking outside for much of the weekend, going through different parks. We're visiting some family and some friends, and uh, we just uh, really noticing how the leaves had com completed their their turn. You know, like it, it starts a little bit in October, and then by the end of November, they're they're pretty much finishing their their fall. And in similar fashion, we were out at a coffee shop, and I noticed that time of year, the Christmas music started to play in the back, the, the background. And I remember my time as a little kid when I was four years old, dancing with my grandmother to all the all the Christmas songs during Christmas time. So I, I, I'm listening to this, and I see it. Summer's over. We, we've got, we're making it through fall. And I can see Christmas on the horizon. It is right there. So as we prepare for this Christmas holiday, we're about to enter the season of Advent. And what I want to do today is I want to conclude and open a new series. Um, and our new series is going to be called Prepare. As we prepare for Christ's arrival in the Incarnation, we are just the same going to do a series of uh, uh, sermons and lessons uh, outside of Sunday in which we are going to look at preparing ourselves. Um, so today we're going to conclude our previous series called Encounters with Jesus and transition into this new series called Prepare. And what I want to do is I want to uh, evaluate a a situation, an encounter with Jesus Christ in which he was preparing his disciples for his final trial and his death and crucifixion. He prepares them. He prepares their hearts. They will be heartbroken. They are going to lose all hope as their teacher whom they loved would suffer enormous cruelty on the cross and die with complete certainty. I suspect they question his identity as Messiah. They would question what they've done with their life. They would fear for their lives or go into hiding. They would be trembling, hoping no one would ever find out. They would deny their close relationship at a minimum, deny even knowing him at a maximum. They would become hopeless in their faith, lost in their grief, and trapped in their despair. Christ knows this, and he tries to prepare them because he knows all things, and he wants them to be ready to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. They just have to get through this difficult season with a beautiful season on the other side of the horizon. A couple weeks ago, in similar fashion, I addressed the sacrifices and hardships of our Christian leaders during the Reformation. I address how they stood for the truth in a world bent on bringing them down. It's amazing when you really ponder the sacrifice of those, uh, even today, those, those of old, but also those of today who are willing to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. How do we react to this call to remain steadfast and courageous in a hostile world? How do we prepare to exercise sacrifice in a humble manner, especially during those times in which we are going to have despair and hopelessness. How did the Old Testament saints deal with the occupation of, or being occupied by different foreign powers through the intertestamental period, years after God had closed his book on the prophets? I think the answer is found in this long passage in John uh, uh, chapter 16 called the Upper Room Discourse. Now, it extends to several chapters at the end of John, but today I'm going to be in John 16. I'm going to be in uh, verses uh, 20 through 22. So if you go ahead and turn there, um, you're going to notice 
a series, there's actually six series of preparatory um, explanations. Jesus is explaining to them what they need to know. He's praying for them. He's, he's preparing them. And simply stated, with the application right up front, what we're going to see here is God's going to prepare and mold us to survive grief with an expectation of reuniting with him on the other side. I'll say that again. God will give us just enough grace to survive the dark of night with a promise of light in the morning. God will work through us. He will lead us to sacrifice in spite of our limitations. And he's going to help us serve in this life, sacrificially, humbly, through all kinds of trial, with the expectation of seeing him on the other side. I'm in John 16, verse 20, and at this point Jesus has explained uh, numerous things to his, to his disciples about prayer and the Holy Spirit, about his connection with the Father. But right here specifically, what you're going to see is he's, he says, I'm going to go away for a while, then I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to go away for a little bit, then I'm coming back. And they don't get it. They don't understand. See, we get to see the story on the other side. What's he talking about? And they start disputing back and forth. But very specifically, he is going to go to the cross. He's going to sacrifice himself for humanity, for those who will believe. And he will raise on the third day. He's predicting their severe grief and fear and hopelessness. But he predicts the joy in the resurrection. Starting in verse 20, I'm just reading three verses here today. Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again. And your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. Right here, Jesus has spent much, much time in the linear context explaining how his upcoming death and resurrection it's going to be this, this great miraculous thing that they just are not expecting. But it is going to occur, and he has to do this. At the same time, he's charging believers to serve sacrificially after this coming trial. See, the story doesn't end with just the resurrection. But there will be the acts of Jesus Christ later. There will be the, um, the epistles where they plant churches that go to the edge of the world. And we see this similar point of sacrificial service in chapter 12, verses 24 to 26. If you turn back just a little bit, chapter 12, he states, quote, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. And here in our given passage, Jesus, in his final message to the disciples, his last words prior to the wrongful trial, and death, and the resurrection, he now echoes the sentiment, comparing and contrasting the concepts of death prior to resurrection, temporary grief prior to eternal joy, and humble sacrifice today with a promise of eternal joy tomorrow. He savors his private time with them. He reminds them of the many critical lessons to carry with them as they carry the gospel to the end of the earth. First, I want to summarize a couple of these, okay? 
I'm just going to pull out a few, a few of these now. They're, they're throughout the entire discourse, starting in chapter 12 to going through 16, 17. But I just want to pull out a few of these that are specifically um, in, this, uh, in this passage, but really through, uh, through the wider passage, but in our given passage for today. Number one, first, loving and humble sacrifice. Loving and humble sacrifice. You'll remember Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. This experience is recorded earlier. With this, within this culture, they would walk around and, and nastiness. And it would have to be the lowliest of the servants who would wash the feet of the disciples. Or sorry, no, wash the feet of the honorary guests. And now that the disciples, they, they fight amongst one another. And what does Jesus do? You remember? He washes their feet. Every single one of them. And he shows this lesson of humility. And he says, listen to this, just one verse here. 13, uh, chapter 13, verse 14. Just one verse. He says to, to them, if I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also, you also ought to wash one another's feet. He sets this new standard for humility and sacrifice. And unconditional love. I've stressed how I've stressed, stressed often how we have to balance, and I, I don't know if it was Providence, but Chaplain Uris literally just said it a minute ago. How we have to be very strong to fight for the truth, to stand on the fundamentals of the faith, to call out wrong when it is wrong. But at the same time, we have to be gentle. Love and compassionate and plead with people with a, a loving disposition, showing humility and grace. We see this concept throughout the epistles. Just a, a couple verses here. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. Quote, therefore, I, the prisoner, this is Paul speaking, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in the hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Later in Ephesians 5, 1 through 2, he says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. I think Corinthians 13, verse 1, speaks mostly to myself. I find this most applicable. Quote, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I've become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. So being loving and sacrificial and humble is a very, very key thing in our following of Christ and serving Him unconditionally. Second, the discourse presents the imperative need, this critical need for God to work through us. We critically need God to, to work through us. Jesus, Jesus will express this oneness with the Father, how they are distinct but united. He explains the role of the Trinity, the role of the Holy Spirit, how He will come and reveal to them the words to speak to Israel and the surrounding nations. And Jesus explains his relationship to the church, to us. Christians, us, we're distinct, but we are united together. We are one body. Listen to, listen to uh, John 15, 4 through 5. He says to them, he just said this. He says to them, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit 
of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Listen to later, verse 20, just uh, the first part of the verse, it says to them, Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. They need the power of Christ. They need the power of the Spirit. And just the same, we need that strength too. So throughout this upper room discourse, Jesus stresses the hardship to come, both in the days after his death, those three critical days, but well later, the persecution that they will all experience to the ends of the earth. Most of them will be martyred. Most of them will be killed. Even the early church received persecution. So he stresses this need to abide in him, to rely on the spirit, and to unite as a body. He advocates unconditional love and humility and sacrifice. He highlights the bitter grief they're going to experience. And he stresses the joy on the other side of the chasm. He will be betrayed. He'll be wrongfully accused. He'll be legally tried and executed, though pronounced innocent. And their world is going to collapse right before their eyes. They critically need the power of God. They will lose their teacher and their Lord. They will lose their hope in Israel. They will lose the promise of being, receiving the reward of following the king. They will likely experience at least inner conflict within Jesus' identity. So Jesus readdresses the matter. Right here in these few verses, he, he stresses all these different, uh, I, maybe we can call them Christian virtues. But he specifically tries to prepare them for uh, the situation that they're going to face. And what you'll notice here, if you look at it, you're going to see kind of a, uh, a compare-contrast statement. You're going to start here, the, but on the contrast, you're going to be here. You're going to start here, you're going to end up here, okay? Look at the formula within verse 20. It reads here, Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. So they're going to start with grief, but it's going to turn to joy. Essentially, the, the world will rejoice, right? But eventually the tables turn. He echoes the same sentiment. Actually, I think he, he caps it in verse 22. He finalizes the point. And he uses this perfect illustration, something that we can probably understand with just a little bit of, you know, ninth grade biology class or reading an article or just common knowledge, I might say. Look at verse 21. Let's dig into this a little bit. In verse 21, he says, he uses this illustration of the woman having, going through labor, but then finally giving birth to the child and receiving the child into the family, into the home. I, I'm amazed by this, so let's take a look at it real quick. Um, he says here, verse 21, whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy the child has been born into the world. I recently had the opportunity to go up north and uh, um, see, see some family members. They are, my, my brother and sister-in-law are expecting their first child and everyone is overjoyed. It will be the first grandchild in our generation for, I guess, the, the siblings or however we say that. And... Um, they're, they're very overjoyed. But at the same time, 
they, they know that the challenge is which way. They, they know that there will be some, some, some stress. Even, even it, it, when you look at our situations with medical advances, childbirth is risky and can be, can be dangerous, can be scary. I deployed once with a, a surgeon and uh, she, she was going to be a trauma surgeon for the soldiers, but her, um, her expertise was she was an OBGYN. And, you know, you got many, many hours on a, on a plane going here and going there, so, you know, I got to ask her questions. She asked me questions or whatever, but I remember, it's a long time ago, I remember she explained to me how she could keep doing surgeries for 18 hours straight, and she, but she knew her limitations. She had so much skill and knowledge and capability. Her, she, her body and her mind physically could go 18 hours straight. But at that point, she would have to be double-checked. She explained all the tools that she had and all the skill. And it's amazing, though, if you go back 50 years, 100 years, what it was like. Certainly in this situation, in this world, horrific pain and the prospect of death find childhood. And I would, I might argue today, natural childbirth remains an amazing horror, a traumatic event, followed by pure joy and love. It remains this medical mystery, how a woman generates special hormones to the point she can have this close attachment to a child whom only minutes earlier was a severe threat to her life. And God specifically uses much of our life experiences to reveal himself to us. We know very well how God uses marriage between a man and a woman to demonstrate his connection and love for his church. Similarly, we very well see this Death-gripping sacrifice in childbirth as an illustration of Christ's sacrifice on the cross with his eventual resurrection and conquering over sin and death, his feet over it on the other side as his perfect illustration of Christ's love for us. In fact, many theologians have, have developed uh, different um, theologies with uh, these different concepts, both with Christ and the church, but also we can dig into here and other points in the Bible. Uh, in fact, one uh, specific um, leader, Pope John Paul II, he made considerable scholastic contributions years ago by developing a, quote, theology of the body, end of quote. So he really dug into this and he developed a, a a very elaborate uh, work. It was one of the main contributions of his life. Uh, he evaluated human sexuality, he evaluated marriage, and the entire process of new life from conception to, to growth and to birth. Now there's many, many, many examples. We don't have time for this, all of it today, but I just want to throw out one. One example of many was how Jesus became Flesh. He became incarnate in a human womb, namely Mary. Therefore, this, this womb of a woman is this sacred place which often bears the image of God, man, us. And just the same, just the same, you'll recall another illustration of the Ark of the Covenant residing in the Holy of Holies, in the temple, which is the presence or the image of God. Eventually, God incarnate in the flesh resides within the womb of a woman. And that is an illustration of a tabernacle of its own. Ultimately, Christ interacts and honors the sacred and miraculous gift of motherhood. How do we wrap our minds around a woman bringing life into the world, how she can suffer terrible pain and 
move from this near-death experience to pure love and joy. I think it's clear within the text. God very specifically provides this reality as an illustration for his sacrifice, dying a death we deserve, and pure joy which, which awaits the Christian on the other side of the chasm when we reunite with him. And it's incredible how the disciples overcame their utter despair and fear, crippling fear, to message of the gospel, the message of Christ to the ends of the earth. How is that possible? Why did they change from unbelieving cowards from their perspective, as written, to the most courageous preachers until their eventual death? I want to quickly suggest two points, two appl uh, applicational points, two summary points to take with us as we close today. Uh, and these are specifically for our, our assembly. Two specific points for us. First, we need to humbly serve sacrificially. We need to humbly serve sacrificially as we await for our union with Christ. Washing feet, childbirth, dying for a friend. These are all illustrations within the discourse, but... As the disciples come to faith, they receive a commission to witness courageously and go into the world and spread the gospel to the end of the globe. And they're going to do this despite threats of opposition, violence, and hatred towards them. And they're going to do it in a sacrificial and humble way. We too need to take this, these bold and courageous actions, but also with Loving, humility, and sacrifice. We recently had our, our church council, and we were talking about the importance of outreach and how important it is to us. And I'm so encouraged how everyone agreed it is important. The only disagreement is exactly how are we going to do that during this Advent season? How do we go out and reach people and bring them in? I pray we will continue to work together, stay united, be united, and try to find uh, solutions with the power of the Spirit working through us to help us take a time that maybe is a little bit of, you know, surface level cultural Christianity, the most wonderful time of the year, that type of sentiment, Thanksgiving going into Christmas, something that is surface level and maybe inch deep, and to encourage people to come out to these wonderful, these wonderful services that we do and bring them in and lead them to Christ. And that leads us very well to our second point. Second, we need to rely on the power of Christ who abides in us. We need to rely on Christ. We need to rely on the Spirit. And we need to unite as a chapel congregation. Now, we see a really, really hard lesson which comes in the early part of Acts. Christ warns them, he pleads with them, and they still sort of mess it up. It's a really hard lesson which the disciples had to learn the, the hard way. Unless we abide in Christ, unless we have the power of the Spirit, we have nothing. You can have all the strategic knowledge and all the planning committees and the most charismatic leadership, but none of that is worth anything without the power of Christ, the unity in the body, the relying of Christ as He as our Lord who has given us the power of His Word. As the Spirit moves hearts and helps people to respond in faith. We have to remain united as a congregation, showing a united front as we go outside these walls and encourage the lost, the unfaithful, to dare cast a shadow on the door back there, and step in, and become the faithful. We just had Veterans Day this last week, and I briefly found myself, very briefly, 
found myself drawn to social media, and I was absolutely overjoyed and pleased when we've had so much division. We've had so much division in our country, as such was just mentioned. But next thing you know, a few days later, I saw a bunch of veterans posting a simple self-pick, very humbly and very nicely, and just said, hey, thank you. I wore the uniform, you wore the uniform, thank you. That was it. Not a lot of showboating, not a lot of bragging. It's a very simple, hey, I served, you served, thank you. I saw some unity there. I saw some humility there. Even on the other side of the sacrifice all veterans and their families have made through the years. I think we see this ultimate picture of humility with Christ Jesus and his sacrifice for us. We see an enormous humility and sacrifice as the apostles and the early church followed suit. We saw that with the reformers. And I think we've even seen a, a significant sacrifice and humility in many of our veterans. I think we need to look at all those pictures. And we need to apply them to ourselves. Serving sacrificially, humbly, relying on Christ as we take this gospel to the ends of the earth. And reach a loving hand across the base during this coming season of Advent. Let us pray. Oh Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the, the reminder that we are going to have times of trial. We are going to have times of hardship. But we are called to not work in our own strength, but to work in your strength. We serve today, awaiting our reunification, our reuniting with you tomorrow. And we thank you so much that we have your, your, the picture of your service and others who have come before us. And a reminder to, to follow after you and not the things of this world. I ask that you will implant that in our hearts. To help this congregation come together and to serve as we prepare to, to enter the season of Advent and as we prepare to continue to serve you in the coming months. Pray this in your holy blessed name, Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Stephen. If you would stand now for our recessional hymn, rejoice the impure in heart.
your people have gathered to worship. And may we go forward to serve with your blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and grant you peace. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful week.